Hello fiber friends and welcome to another day of Vlogmas. As you can see, I have some exciting updates to share with you today and we will get to that. I also have another new project idea because I couldn't help it. So we'll get to that as well, as well as some other spinning updates. But I want to go right ahead and open up the fiber for today because if it's the one I think I remember it is, it's one of my favorites. And I can't wait to show you. So let's get that open and see what we'll be spinning. In day number eight, we have our blessing that says, may all your woolens be warm and your linens be cool. Which is perfect because I have some linens and woolens to show you today. <laughs> That was completely by accident, but I'm happy how that lined up. That's pretty fun. And then we have a little washable tag that says, this is the back. <laughs> I thought it was just the cutest little tag. And uh, so you can put that if you have any sewn garments or hats with a seam or whatever, you can put it so that you can tell which way is the back. I'm probably going to stitch this into the sweater that I knit, the woolen, that goes with my new linen dress. That's my plan for it. So let me know what your plan for your tag is. If you have one, let's take a look at this fiber. Oh my goodness. We have some smoke. We have some flames. We have... Ooh, it's so pretty. <laughs> this is BFL and silk. That's Blueface Lester and silk. And it has pops of yellow through it. And it has this beautiful kind of a creamy, um, almost like a taupe color. It's so pretty. I love this one. So how are we going to spin it? I've had quite a few requests. I've had requests for uh, Jilgen medieval style spindles, Neolithic style spindles, and I've had requests for a great wheel. I do have a great wheel. Um, I think patrons got of. I think patrons got the video when I found that. I don't think I put it on my main YouTube channel. That was a Patreon exclusive, but. It does need restoration, so it's not in current spinnable condition, but I could bring it down and show you. Maybe we'll do that in the next one. Um, and I still have my Canadian production wheel, so we could do that also. So many options. So I'm gonna think about which one we'll be doing. And while I'm considering how I wanna spin this, um, let's take a look at my finished dress, because I'm so excited about it. Lots of people were asking me what dress pattern I used, and the dress pattern is called Wolf Fork, and it's in the Embody Capsule Wardrobe book by Jacqueline Seasluck. And I'm not an affiliate, just a fan. So this dress comes in lots of different variations that you can um, sort of choose your own sewing adventure. So you can do with sleeves, without sleeves, short sleeves. You can do different lengths of the dress with pockets or not, cropped, tunic. So there are lots of variations. I did get the collar fixed. So here's a couple clips of what that looked like. I've come to a decision on how to address the problem with my dress with the collar just gaping. I had it hanging up overnight, um, which I was going to do anyway before hemming the the bottom hem but anyway yeah this is too stretched out which is frustrating because I did put interfacing on it but it just it happened so I think I'm gonna pull my scraps out of my scrap basket and see if I have enough to put together a different um, collar <laughs> and I am going to bring these up the pattern had the front piece cut on an angle and then the back piece cut straight. So, so it makes more of a shoulder, but for, for my shoulders, that just doesn't work. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna redo the 
the arm because the arm is fine, but I am going to move this seam just over <laughs> like that. And I think having it uh, come up just, just enough so that it comes, this is hard to do with one hand, so that it comes over straighter, I think is going to help. It's going to lift this. It's going to prevent the sagging gapingness here. Um, I'm going to redo this so that it isn't all stretched out. I'll make sure that the interfacing is good and fused. And then I will stitch it back on. So I think that's going to help. This is the before shoulder. And this is the after shoulder. And it has lifted this part up. You can see how this is scooped down. So I'm going to match the shoulders and get that stitched. And I think it's going to fit very uh, nicely on my shoulders. It's going to be a lot better. I completely removed the other collar. It's gone. I did adjust the seams on the shoulders. I just um, pulled it up more and then did another seam there. And then I recut the um, the collar pieces with interfacing and so I'm pinning them and I'm about to sew it on but I feel like this is coming together smoother and the shoulders did apparently correct the gaping issue in the front I don't think I'll 100% know until I get the collar finished but it's looking good so far <laughs> that's where we're at So this now has a beautiful facing all the way around it and it's much sturdier. It's holding the fabric in a much more stable way and it's not spreading out. I love how clean and neat the neckline looks. I wish it looked a little bit more historical, like a little bit more history bounding, but that, you know, there's nothing stopping me from doing a tablet woven band that I can stitch around this later. The rest of it, the pockets, I love the pockets. They're perfect. And I did do this tie out of the, um, the linen that I cut the dress from and then kind of made it like a, like a bias tape, folded it and stitched it so that it made this nice little belt. But I have plans to do all kinds of different tablet woven belts <laughs> and different techniques, maybe just ankle woven, not even tablet woven, and make a lot of different kinds of belt styles for this because I think that would be so much fun um, and a cool thing to explore, especially with hand spun. So I am all about adding those hand spun details wherever I can. Here is the full look and I love it. I think it's so wonderful and um, yeah, I just, I love it so much. It's great, it's, it's just perfect. And this will get the, this is the back tag when I weave in those seams. So there it is, the finished look. We just have so many things to talk about, so I'm just, I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> we'll get to the spinning, I promise. I'm leaning towards maybe, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> we'll figure it out. All right, so um, what's next? I have a weaving project that I want to, to do, and so I did spend some time working on that because I still have to finish spinning all the yarn for it. So here's where that's here's where that is. I have these green and silver sparkly uh, fibers already spun up, and the green has a partner a partner yarn with red sparkles. So I got that spun on my ladybug, but I still need to ply it. I think I'm going to have a plying party, and then I did find I had a red-ish color, but it was a little bit too peach. Um, I think it could have worked. I could have made it work. It was a little coral. But I found this, which is more of an orangey red, and I think it goes a little bit better with this um, sparkly red. So this will be the partner for that, and I still have my green, which just looks 
fantastic with this green. So my plan was to do a weaving project with all of this and I'm still hoping to get that done but I am currently right now in the process of overloading myself with projects. And here is another quick little update. This is the blue from day seven finished on my Turkish spindle. And because I have this to ply and I have this sparkly red to ply, I might just need to have a plying party and just ply a bunch of stuff. Also a quick little insert of self promotion here. I have these awesome ring distabs that are from Katrinkles. They are uh, shipping. <laughs> so they are about to be restocked in my shop. They are shipping to me from Katrinkles. It's a restock. So those should be in the next couple days restocked. They've been out. People also ask me all the time where I get my spinners control cards. And these are also made by Katrinkles, but they have the Jillian Eve logo on them. And these are also in my store, in my shop. They also sold out and they are also in that restock order that is shipped and on its way to me. So as soon as those arrive on my doorstep, I will have them restocked in the shop. Um, and hopefully if you order quickly when they restock, you might make it for Christmas. And if you are interested in any spinning wheels, I have Shacked spinning wheels for sale in my shop as well. Shacked has had a huge demand lately, especially because of the new quartet uh, attachment that goes on the Cricut and it turns the Cricut loom into a four shaft tabletop loom, which is amazing because I love twill. And uh, so if you are interested in either the loom, the attachments, if you are looking for any of the shacked spinning wheels, sidekick, uh, matchless, ladybug, uh, flat iron. I don't know why this is flat iron. <laughs> um, I do sell all of those in my shop. And if you have questions, you can shoot me a message through my shop and I will help you figure out which spinning wheel is the right one for you. Be aware that Shacked has a huge demand right now and they are hurrying to finish all of their orders, but right now they are shipping about six to eight weeks out. Um, so if you did order a wheel now, it probably wouldn't arrive for several, several weeks. But if someone is looking for one for Christmas, you can always wrap a picture of it. I mean, we've had to do that when we've had gifts that didn't make it in time. It's just a thing that happens, but uh, yeah, so a little self-promotion there. I wanted you to know about that. And also when I finish Vlogmas, because this is a lot of work, and we get into January, February, I will be restocking more regularly with dyed fibers uh, for you to purchase and spin and some other fun stuff. I have some cute merch in there, some stickers, some different things. So go check that out and let's get spinning. I'm thinking medieval. Let's... Let's do some medieval, let's do some medieval spinning. How about that? Medieval spinning does take a little longer, so I won't have it finished in this video. You'll have to come to the next one for the update, number nine, but we can get it started and I'll show you what that looks like. So let's grab some medieval style spindles and get spinning. I have quite a few medieval style um, spindle whorls. Some of them are replicas. Some of them are very similar to uh, worlds that have been found that were medieval time period. These two are soapstone. Soapstone was a common um, material to be used, particularly in anywhere that had soapstone, which is a lot of places had soapstone, but also um, sort of like northern, uh, northern Europe. I also have this glass whorl. Um, this is just a little a little uh, little gasket thing that helps it stay on the stick. Uh, but I also have this one. This is modern blown glass, but any time that a culture had access to glass technology, we see glass being used for um, textile types of uses, whether that's beads or whorls or um, distabs even. So glass is pretty fun too. So which one should I use? How about I do one with glass and one with soapstone? I feel like I've had some of these on my spins recently, on my spindles recently. So let's go with soapstone and glass. I will have a link for all of these in the video description. Um, it's an affiliate link, so if you're interested in trying out any of this equipment for yourself, you can find some good resources that way. 
and it also helps support the channel when you use my affiliate links so I do appreciate that um, if you make a purchase I may earn a small commission so this is a replica of a spindle stick we see that a lot of spindle sticks in the medieval period and of course I am referring to medieval European spinning here uh, because that's what I've researched and that's what these tools are replicated from. So bear, bear in mind that different parts of the world and different cultures had uh, different methods and tools and different shapes and techniques and all of that. So uh, what we see though in Europe is that there would be kind of a belly. It wasn't just a straight stick. It had kind of a, a belly in the middle. Because the spindle stick has a tapered shape to it, the whorls also had sort of the internal tapering. The hole that goes through the whorl is also tapered. This whorl is from Glass Bead, and they did a great job of creating a tapered shape to the whorl. You can see if you put it on this way, there's not a lot of gaping at the base of it, but if you put it on the other way, it doesn't go as high on the shaft, and then also there's just a lot of gaping there. So it lets you know which direction this goes on and that it's definitely meant to be a spindle whorl. Now friction will hold it on there and kind of shove it and give it a little twist and that kind of holds it with friction but I also like using these little kind of rubber gasket things because that does help keep it on there. It's glass and I don't want it to break or shatter if I drop it so I'll just kind of shove that up in there and that helps it stay on the spindle stick. Another key factor to medieval style spinning is the distaff. Now I do have a medieval style distaff, but it is loaded up with flax right now, so I'm not going to take my flax off because then to put it back on, that would be a pain <laughs> and it would probably mess it up. So I'm going back to using my ring distaff. Honestly, the ring distaff is a perfect size for this amount of fiber, and I'm not right at this moment attempting to be 100% historically reenacting. I'm just having fun and it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to not be perfectly authentic. It's okay. Um, and we do have evidence, well, a lot of uh, distaff spinning that's depicted in European medieval artwork is with a belted distaff, a long distaff. Um, there is still, especially in Scandinavia, imagery of handheld distaffs. So while this one is uh, more Roman, we see birds on the top of Roman distaffs from earlier time periods. Uh, handheld distaffs still are a thing, so it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> so I'm going to get this going. I've hooked my fiber over the tip of my spindle, and that gets my spin started. And I just give it some twist, draft it out a little, give it some twist, draft it out a little. And then I have a long enough strand to really get my cop going, which is just the section of wrapped fiber on the spindle stick. Give it a half hitch to help it hold on there. And now I'm going to, where usually if I'm doing a supported spin, I'm coming at it from the side. If I'm doing in-hand spinning, I come at it from the top. And I let the working yarn that is being formed come between my index and middle finger. And the spindle kind of dangles in my hand, but I can flick it and let it spin around that way and that's what gives me my twist. Now the key to do this with a handheld distaff is that the fiber has to be very easy to draft because I'm not actually holding the fiber directly. I'm holding the distaff and I'm holding the spindle stick and I have to be able to have the fiber draft between the two. So this method does take practice. It does take a good amount of control. 
um, but it's really fun, really satisfying, and I feel so fancy when it when it works. <laughs> when I can get it to work, it feels like a very fancy spinning. So, when my arms are spread spread apart and it gets harder to reach, I wind it on, do that little half hitch, and then go again. So I am I am kind of holding on to the fiber. I am controlling the fluff a little bit because I don't want all of it to get taken up into the yarn. And I do stop and make some adjustments as I go. So overall there's less hands-on fussing with the wool as I do this method of spinning. You can see it just kind of gently drafting out of the fluff. And my hand is definitely further back. So once I have a long reach, I make sure I have all the twist I want. And I can, you know, butterfly up. It just makes it easier. For our spinning story today, we are going to take a break from the folk tales and fairy tales and classic Christmas stories and we are going to have a deep thoughts with Evie because I feel like my experience of exploring my creativity is not unique to me. I think it's a fairly universal creative experience that a lot of us can relate to and that is the experience of having more ideas than time. <laughs> that is the experience of having our brains output so many um, ideas that just seem shiny that we want to go for each one and we end up with overwhelm and a pile of UFOs and we don't always end up getting to finish the things that we really really want to finish. So let's talk about what it's like to live with a creative brain because while each of our brains are unique, I do find that there are some very common threads of creative experience among <laughs> fiber friends. So I want to tell you about something that I'm just thinking about right now. I went shopping, Christmas shopping with one of my kiddos yesterday. We ran some errands and had a good time going out and looking for some gifts. One of the places we ended up visiting was Joann's and they had a fabric sale. And I get so visually overwhelmed when I go through places like that because I, everything I look at prompts another idea. Everything I look at sparks some something that I want to pursue and I usually walk out of those places exhausted and overwhelmed. <laughs> so yesterday was not unique. I walked out with ideas and I also walked out with fabric <laughs> because I have another project I want to try. It's hard sometimes to live with a creative brain because I'm always coming up with ideas and I've had to I've had to work on being more discerning about not only the time I have to spend on projects but the things that I really want to see through to fruition. Um, it's fine to have a plethora of ideas, but then to pr try and pursue every single idea, it's overwhelming. Um, but sometimes I love the ideas so much I don't want to let go of them. And that can set me up for disaster. So I, I truly hope that's not what I'm doing here, setting myself up for disaster, but it's also a season where I do want to spend time crafting, being cozy, hanging out with my kiddos, having a lovely fire, you know, and that's why I was doing the Vlogmas days every other day so that I could have that extra time um, to just have family time and work on projects together and stuff. And so I do want to pursue some of those things that are just fun for me. And I think it's hard in seasons like this. Wow, this is turning into deep thoughts with Evie. I didn't think we were going to go this deep, but here we are. I, I think this time of year, especially if you're a person who tends to enjoy those kind of host, hosting, hostess activities, and you're the one doing a lot of the decorating and a lot of the gift wrapping or gift selection and um, you know the charity things and cooking and giving and it can turn into a lot of giving and you know if you have a generous personality that can really it can really be a time of year that 
while it should be fun and cozy and about family and community, it can also be very depleting. And that's part of the reason why I've loved to have these Vlogmas videos because so many people have just affirmed that my intention of having a way for people to ex escape the hubbub and take a minute for themselves and just relax and enjoy a video and be with fiber friends, that's restorative. And those things are really important. And so while I am, you know, doing a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of things, I'm busy. I wanted to do a project that was really for me and not just for me, but almost like frivolously for me, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, because I wanted to find something that was just for me in a restorative, creative, kind of way. So don't get me wrong, I love doing Vlogmas. I love these spins that we are doing every every other day, every day. This brings me so much joy. But I also wanted to do something um, that was just scratching a creative itch. And so here we are. Don't forget to do things for you. Even in busy times, carve out that time. It's really important. And that's my deep thoughts with Evie. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I got some ridiculous holiday fabric. I got this <laughs> with these little candy canes and um, little ornaments on it. It's ridiculous, but it's also kind of cute. So if you've seen the shirts that I wear, the t-shirts that I wear in many of my videos, I kind of already have a capsule wardrobe going, um, which we're gonna talk about that more, much more in the new year, but uh, in 2023. But I, I sewed all of those shirts and I have the pattern, it fits and I, I know how to do it. So I can do that fairly quickly. And so what I'd like to do is make one of those shirts again out of this fabric. And then I got this plaid, this green plaid, and I thought this, when you combine it with some red, it just looks very Christmassy. My plan is to make the wool fork dress out of this fabric, but I am going to do the sleeveless version. And then I am going to make a t-shirt out of this fabric that I will wear underneath it. And I think it'll be cute and lots of fun. And then hopefully, I'll be able to weave with this other sparkly stuff that I've been working on. Um, that's my plan. Let's hope I can do it. <laughs> I don't think it'll take me too long. Um, a couple days probably and I'll have it finished. So I'll just work on it a little bit each evening. Chilling out. Having fun. Maybe the fire will still be going depending. Um, but I don't know. Tell me what you think. Is this a good idea? Is this fun? Is it cute? And I thought just because this is green and white without the red, it can just be a cozy flannel dress that I can just wear around in the wintertime. I can wear, I have a purple turtleneck that I could wear under it that would be really cute. And so it can just be kind of a wintry look instead of specifically Christmas. Because while that t-shirt will be specifically Christmas, I do want pieces in my wardrobe that I can wear multiple times throughout seasons. So that's my plan. Let me know what you think. We are having a Vlogmas giveaway this year. I am giving away this Eel Wheel Nano 2. If you'd like to enter to win this, all you have to do is leave a comment on a qualifying Vlogmas video. I have all of the specific details about the giveaway in the description below. The videos that qualify, I believe it's number five through 12 and live streams that happen during that time as well. So good luck, may the odds be ever in your favor. And for the, for the comment of the day, I would love to hear from you. Do you get overwhelmed with ideas sometimes? Do you have more projects than you can complete? And give us some tips that we can all read and, and learn from each other. What are some ways that you manage your creative excitement with balancing the time that you actually have to put towards your crafting? I'd love some tips. 
<laughs> what works for you. So go ahead and leave those comments. And if that's not part of your experience, you can just say, hey, happy Vlogmas, and that'll get you an entry too. It's the comment that matters, that's all. So I will look forward to chatting with you down in the video comment section. Remember to do those YouTube things, like, subscribe, leave that comment and share these videos with your friends because that really truly does help out the channel. I also have a Kofi. You can leave a super thanks. All of those things are really appreciated and help me to be able to do fun things like Vlogmas and keep all of this spinning content coming now and into 2023. So I will see you in the next Vlogmas video where I will show you the finished medieval spin that I have and also probably the plied yarn from day seven. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I will be having a plying party <laughs> and I'll give you updates on my sewing projects as well. So I'll see you then. In the meantime, happy spinning.